<laughs> hey there, welcome to Main Street Living. I'm Cheryl Nelson. Hey guys, I'm Quincy Carr. And I'm Danielle Alvari. So guys, I uh, probably noticed something a little different about me today. Yeah, I can't quite put my finger on it, Cheryl. What yeah. are you... Not sure. The eye, you mean the eye patch? Yeah. <laughs> you can't even notice it. It's like... Yeah, right. Maybe I should blends cover, right in. cover my hair like this. Yeah. So you can't even see just it. Just like no. a little concealer. Yeah. Uh, I know. You know what? You're very fashion forward. Let's just think about it that way. Very I do forward. think it's going to be the eye patch season. Cheryl, so what's, what's going on? Why the eye patch? Okay. So I had eye surgery yesterday. And so I've got to keep this eye patch on for a little bit to protect the eye. So that's why I'm doing this. And I know it's a little unusual, but I'm here. And you're a trooper. Like a yeah. Thank you. Talk like a pirate day is coming up. It's September 19th. So I'm just a little ahead of the game on that, right? Uh, please don't talk like a pirate because then it's just going to mess. It's just going to, like, I know you as Cheryl, the, uh, you know, car driving, old, you know, vehicle oh. keeping person, old vehicle <laughs> keeping person. I don't know you as an That's how I feel today. You know, I, I Can you put, like, it. one of your cats on your shoulder, kind of like your parrot, maybe? <laughs> Would be good as well. I should totally do that. I, you know, I should have waited to have the eye surgery for Halloween because then people probably wouldn't think twice about this. But if, if you're tuning in later in the show and you miss this beginning part, you're going to wonder what is going on with Cheryl today. Yeah. <laughs> Always something. Well, Cheryl, speaking of eyes, uh, we do have a storm going on right now. And, you know, luckily we have our own meteorologist on this yes. show. What can you tell us about the hurricane? Oh my gosh, I know Hurricane Ida impacted so many people across southeastern Louisiana, Mississippi, and then all the way to the points north and east with flash flooding. I mean, so much rain has fallen even far from where Ida made landfall there. And so it's been it's been catastrophic for so many people. Uh, mm -hmm. With the wind, I mean, it made landfall as a Category 4 hurricane, one of the strongest hurricanes to impact the United States in quite some time. And my heart goes out to everybody involved. And it's just it's just scary because we are now entering the peak of hurricane season. Typically mm -hmm. around mid-September is when we start to get that. So we're, we're going to see a lot more activity likely ramping up in the tropics. Yeah, it's not and what we're hoping to hear. No. Yeah, and it hit on the 16 year anniversary of Katrina too. So that was oh. just amazing. Like clockwork. Yeah. It, it, it's super yeah. eerie when you think of it like that because a lot of the same people being impacted. It's just one of those things where I'm going, all right, just hope and pray that, you know, that people are okay and that they can recover. Yeah, I did know. like that Cheryl kind of slipped into her meteorologist voice there. Did you hear it? I did. I <laughs> did. And, and guys, now I'm going to switch back into TV host share because we've got a great show coming up today. In fact, I love the road trips. We're going to explore Nevada and also talk about driving fast cars with a NASCAR driver. That's right, Cheryl. And we check in on who's helping military families and we see how dogs are comforting veterans as well. But first, it is time to take charge of your health, and our next guest is going to help you do that. You don't want to miss it. Hey guys, welcome back to Main Street Living. Now, uh, Cheryl, Danielle, you probably know sometimes you can meet people who are so motivating and inspiring. And, and sometimes it seems like they've accomplished way more than they should be able to fit in one person's life. Right? <laughs> Definitely. And our next guest is one of those people. He's a chef, an actor, an author, a filmmaker, a dad. He's also a man on a mission to help people take control of their health. Please welcome to Main Street Living, Charles Maddox. Charles, thanks so much for making the time for us. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for having so me. So where, I mean, where do we start with you, right? So people man. may know you today as a health <laughs> advocate, but you didn't start out that way, right? You started out as a musician and an actor. What can you tell us about that part of your career? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I don't like to name drop or anything, but but I got my inspiration from my late uncle, the legendary uh, Bob Marley. And, and I wanted to be a I wanted to make music. I wanted to do something. I didn't know what I wanted to do. But obviously music back then when I was young was probably the easiest thing for me to do. So I remember I saw an LL Cool J video and I was inspired and I said, man, you know what? I'm going to find this guy. I lived in Long Island. He lived probably about 45 minutes away from me. 
and I, I literally stalked his house till we became the best of friends and made music together. And that's how I kind of got off into the whole music things. And a lot of doors opened from that. And then from there, um, I wanted to be on Sesame Street. And uh, I, I bumped into a great manager who knew some great people at some big agencies. And uh, that's how I got into uh, making films and television. It's, it's been a ride, you know. I love that. What made you want to be on Sesame Street? I think that's so intriguing. <laughs> I had just I had just had a son and I kind of thought like, man, I want to be on Sesame Street so that he sees me on Sesame Street. And um that so that that really was my inspiration is that I just wanted to see have my son see me on Sesame Street. It wasn't to act and and literally they would call me and, and this was like William Morris, you know, one of the biggest agencies. And they would call me and they would say, Charles, you know, we've got some sides down here for you. And I'm like, sides, what are those? And uh, <laughs> I would just go down anyhow, pick them up. And next thing you know, I'm, I'm auditioning for all these major roles and, and, uh, and, and it was, and, but I was booking them and it was like, wow, you know, um, this is, this is a good thing. And it, it wasn't until I failed one or two times with Deborah, it failed one or two times with Deborah Aquila. Deborah cast at Shawshank Redemption and a bunch of other big movies, a bunch of other big movies. And, and I remember saying, man, next time I see her, I'm not going to mess this up because she wanted to cast me in some other TV shows badly. You could see it. So I said, you know what? I'm going to take this thing serious. And I came back and uh, wooed her away with a film uh, for a role that I played alongside uh, Cuba Gooden Jr., Omar Epps, uh, Maura Kelly, and a few other big names. So, you know, that's, that's kind of when I started to take it serious and said, you know what, I can't let these, these opportunities go by the wayside. Just to be a cool dad on Sesame Street, of all things, that's how yeah. it started. <laughs> well, that's, how, that's how Morgan Freeman started. So, I mean, you know. That's right. So that, of course, you did make a pivot at one point. You started teaching people about how to prepare healthy and delicious meals that were also affordable with the poor chef. What brought about that change in your focus and, and why did you go down that path? To be honest, it wasn't anything I really chose or looked for. I had left Los Angeles to be a single dad, moved to Florida to be a little closer to my mom. And because uh, she's sick right now with a condition called CRPS that I actually did a film on it's called Complex Regional Pain Syndrome, beautiful film documentary. And uh, so one day me and my son were walking into a, a restaurant and this is before the whole craze of, of what things are now. And he said, wouldn't it be really cool to see people make real meals? And I said, wow, that, that is a good idea. So I thought, you know what? And I, and I came up with this name called The Poor Chef. And I, I went to some local TV stations out here like Fox and NBC and, and thought, hey, listen, this, I've got an idea, right? And they bought into it. Next thing you know, one thing led to another, doing weekly segments and cookbooks and sauces and all that kind of stuff like that. So that, that's kind of how it opened up my eyes to the whole healthy food and healthy alternative thing. That's really cool that you were doing that. And did you get a diagnosis that changed your own life as well? I did. I did. Several, I would say several years later, I was literally just weekend hanging out, you know, and I noticed I was using the bathroom a little bit too much. And I thought, you know what, man, I, let me go to a, a little doctor, a little clinic and tell them something and walk out with some antibiotics or something, you know, and because that's usually the fix. And uh, he said, well, ha, ha, do you have a family history of diabetes? I said, diabetes. I literally thought I was going to die. And he said, he said, you know, I can give you some medication. And I said, you know what? Um, I'm not, I'm not, I wasn't ready to do that. I went home and, and really just started to look into what this whole thing was. And it just opened up my eyes to um, the world of, of healthcare. And, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to tell some stories and I'm going to make it my mission to have a face like me tell some stories. Absolutely. And I mean, it's funny you say that. I mean, not funny, but you said that you thought you were going to die. A lot of people don't really understand diabetes and a lot of people don't even know that they have prediabetes or what the yeah. symptoms are. So that's yeah. so true. What, what changes did you start to make to your lifestyle to sort of begin managing your diabetes? Man, I, I, I was one of those guys. I used to go to the gym every day. And you know, those guys who they've got the big muscles, but then they got a tummy. <laughs> They don't, they don't, they don't do any cardio. They've got all of this like this. And the and dad like, bod. Yeah. Oh, no, no. No, no, dad bod, no dad bod. Dad bod. You don't let you let it go. You know, this was <laughs> arms and chest. This wasn't any, any cardio. So I said, yep. you know what? 
I'm done doing that. And I literally, I just, I said, well, what is the best diet? And I couldn't figure it out. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go, I'm going to do God's diet, right? And, and lean meat, fish, proteins, uh, vegetables and fruit. And I said, no more gym. I'm going to start walking. And I would say literally within uh, two months, I probably lost 25 pounds. Not that I was overweight like that, but I just needed to, to get rid of the muscle and, and slim down. And, and uh, it changed my life. Oh, you are so much fun to talk to. We're going to take a little break. So everybody hold on right there. We're going to have a lot more with Charles coming up in just a few minutes. Welcome back to Main Street Living. We are back with the multi-talented Charles Maddox telling us a little bit about his own health journey. We've already learned a lot so far, but we've got so many more questions for you. And you were talking about your type 2 diabetes diagnosis and how you made some changes in your own lifestyle, but you also want to inspire others. What are you doing to help others feel good and feel okay about it? Yeah, uh, you know, I created some 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 programs. Uh, the first is called Reverse, which is uh, it's a diabetes docu reality series, and I wanted to be able to reach people in a way that literally they could sit right in in their own homes and see other people who are making the changes and doing the things that need to be done to to live their best healthy life. And uh, we had one amazing, beautiful season a few years ago that we shot in beautiful Jamaica, and then we have another season um called reverse that uh we just shot in costa rica that's going to be coming out soon too as well and you know i'll just give you a, 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 a i don't want to give you too much of a sneak preview but let's just say we have truly reversed type 2 diabetes in many of these cases wow mm. yeah yeah wow. um them- i mean it obviously affects so many americans too so it's just great that we're able to get more and more resources on that obviously i know you have another new docu series 8 days it's going yeah. to be running on your view through early october what is it about yeah that is um it, it's the same premise and cuz what i really want to do is expose conditions that people you know, don't get enough attention, don't get enough exposure, don't get enough, you know, publicity. So what we did was we took five people who were living with cancer and at various stages, and we brought them to Mexico, teamed up with an amazing company out there that does uh, tremendous work with cancer and really wanted to tell the stories from a mental, physical, spiritual, emotional state from a, a patient standpoint, but also a caregiver standpoint, their loved ones and how they deal with this, right? People are dealing with cancer every day and we never get a chance to really go into understanding what it's like to live with it, what it's like to, to fight this battle and be in fear of, of, of losing your life to something like this. So it's a beautiful, touching uh, uh, a docu-series, not a reality series, a docu-series. And um, it, it's game changing. And, and, and those lives, if, if you see it, those lives are all changed too as well. Mm. Wow. And your focus has been so much on diabetes, understandably. So what in you made you want to focus on cancer and do a show on that? Well, my, my father died from cancer, passed from oh, cancer in 2014. Yeah. So, and it, and it literally came out of nowhere. I had seen him, I was on a, a diabetes RV tour that I created actually in New York. Mm. And I had stopped in there to hang out with him. And, and I think maybe a month later, um, I got a call. I was in Jamaica, West Indies, and I got a call and they said, hey, man, your father's in the hospital. I'm like, hospital? And literally, I, I got there and... and um, you know, stayed with him probably for maybe about two and a half weeks in the hospital. And uh, mm. he didn't make it too much, you know, longer than that. Uh, you know, so this was probably a month from from the time I saw him to to him passing. So and no symptoms, you know, so it was wow. it was uh, it was it was amazing that uh, I was able to to spend that time with him, though, you know. Yeah, I mean. That's, I mean, it's amazing, right? And I mean, what really are you kind of hoping that viewers can take away from these shows? Yeah, you know, um, when we look at reverse, it's really about, once again, it's about an, an emotion, mental, physical, and spiritual changes. The health changes will come, right? If you, if you educate people the right way, if you inspire people, 
the right way. A lot of us need just inspiration. And I think that's what reverse really does. It inspires people. And then they, then they make the changes on their, their, on their own. We, you know, it, we're not teaching anything that, that people already don't know. And, you know, when we look at eight days, once again, it's more just about alternatives, that there are other you know, treatment opportunities, that there are, are ways to, to eat, even with diet, even with cancer, that, you know, that has to go in line with, with whatever, you know, treatment that you're seeking. So it's not just a one, you know, thing fits all. You really have to make the changes, uh, you know, overall to who the person that you are. I what love that. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say to someone who receives a diagnosis and they just go down and they get depressed and they they feel like their life is over and they don't know what to do? What would you say to inspire them to keep going, to not give up? Yeah, you know, you know, I I went when I came home when he wanted to put me on medication, I got on the internet and man, I had said a few things and some 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 uh, chat rooms and I, man, I was attacked and I said, Ooh, I'm not getting in here anymore. So it, it could have been easy just for me to take the medication. And, and I probably would have been in a depressed state right now. Right. Because if I didn't take, make those changes as far as health and, 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 and everything that I did, who knows where I'd be right now? I think that I think my diagnosis of diabetes was actually one of the best things that have happened to me because now I was aware of where we are and where my health is. Right from from a from a blood pressure standpoint, cholesterol standpoint, body it, it, mass index standpoint, it, it actually let me be aware of of what's next. So I think if we empower ourselves and don't just you know, just grab medication because it's, 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 it's somebody says you need it. Go and find out what that medication is. Find out ways to, to, to treat yourself with foods and exercise and healing. And uh, so we don't have to be depressed. There's a ton of amazing doctors out here and people that you can find that are here to help you. All right. Well, I'm inspired and I'm not even sick. So, I mean, you just, I mean, you make such a good point that you have to just really advocate for your own health and, and take control of your own health. Um, so I'm obviously inspired. Where can people go to find more about your shows and learn more about you? Definitely. They can go to my, my Twitter, which is uh, right here. <laughs> and <laughs> they can go to, they can Google me. I mean, I'm not hard to find. I'm all over the place, you know? <laughs> He's led many lives at this point. <laughs> I love it. I love it. You're yeah. wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your story. Blessings. Blessings. All right. We've got more Main Street Living coming up next. Welcome back to Main Street Living. We love to see businesses supporting organizations that are doing good in our community, and especially when it impacts our veterans like our own Quincy. Well, thank you, Cheryl. And yeah, I can tell you, a California law firm is providing support for Shelter to Soldier. It's a local nonprofit organization that saves dogs and veterans in need. Take a look at this. Shelter to Soldier is nine years young with a mission to save lives two at a time. We're adopting dogs from local shelters, training them for post 9-11 combat veterans, and we're able to donate these trained dogs to deserving veterans in need. Service dogs can range anywhere from 15 to 35, $40,000. And for someone getting out of the military that's seeking support and help, um, having that sort of price tag is daunting. So we really wanted to be able to support the veterans to make sure that they're getting a dog that they need in their life at no charge. Um, the other side of this, of course, is the dogs. Sadly, roughly 1,800 of them euthanized every day. You know, I was in a very dark place. Um, I was having suicidal thoughts, and I really needed an immediate help. We don't know if tomorrow is going to be there for us. Uh, so I found Shelter the Soldier uh, online, and I reached out, and somebody contacted me within 24 hours. And in the next couple, couple of weeks, I was already in the program meeting dogs. Most of the dogs that are in shelters for reasons like chewing on the couch or being too crazy with the kids are exactly the type of dog that we look for because we can harness that energy into a really strong working service dog. From the time that we adopt a dog from a shelter or a rescue organization to the time that they graduate the program is about 12 to 18 months. 
Dogs make such a huge difference for anyone in need, especially veterans, those working through post-traumatic stress, traumatic brain injury, um, hypervigilance, nightmares, night terrors. All of our dogs are trained for psychiatric service work. Um, in addition to those, we also, once we get to know the approved veteran and what their needs are, we can fine tune and add specific items. Our dogs do watch where they'll go between the legs and face backwards and literally cover that handler's six or watch their back. They touch, they create um, engagement. So it, it literally snaps that person out of uh, a negative thought. You know, he knows when my anxiety is, is starting to amp up and he'll come over and just kind of put his head down on my lap and just let me know that he's here for me. Shelter to Soldier is a nonprofit and we're able to do the work that we do because of you, the community. Uh, whether it's an individual donating $5 or whether it's a corporate donor like the Barnes Firm that's supporting us and sponsoring multiple dogs that are going to make an impact in the veterans' lives in need. There are still 20 to 22 veterans committing suicide uh, a day. And the more that we can reach those veterans, uh, the better chance we have to lower that number. Him by my side 24-7 has completely turned my life around. It's not just saving both of our lives. It has made an impact on myself, Nigel, my family, my work. Uh, so yes, they definitely have saved our lives. Wow, ladies, uh, that was a truly impactful uh, segment there. Now, um, this is especially impactful for me because I heard this week a fellowship mate of mine in the Navy. Uh, he actually took his own life. So, um, you know, especially during this month, my heart does go out to the family and condolences and everything, especially with his children. I think he left a, a son and a daughter behind. So. Oh, I mean, I'm so sorry, Quince. Yeah. yeah. It's horrible. I'm so sorry that you had to go through that. And Thankfully, there are programs out there like this that hopefully can help. And to learn more about this incredible program, visit sheltertosoldier.org. Yes. And don't go anywhere because if you're one of those people who feels the need for speed, you're going to love our next guest. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to Main Street Living. You guys know that I like to drive, probably not the fastest driver in the world, and 20-year-old men can sometimes get a bad rap for driving too fast, but for our next guest, driving fast is his job. It's crazy, right? Now, at just 20 years old, he's already had success as a NASCAR driver. Let's welcome to the show Howie DeSafino the third. What's going on, good friend of mine? Kind of, sort of. <laughs> How have you been, man? You've been all right. Not too bad. Good, good. Well, you know, I know that we have our history on another show, but, you know, for the viewers of this show, how did your dream of being the NASCAR driver begin? Uh, my dream uh, as a NASCAR driver began when I went to the Richmond Raceway for the first year when I was eight years old. I saw these, like, little arena cars, and I was like, damn, I really want to get into one of those. And so, uh, it was, just, it was just one of those things to where, you know, I asked my dad several times. I was like, hey, can I, you know, can I start racing? Can I start racing? And then eventually four years later, when I was 13 years old, he uh, he let me start racing. So uh, it, was, it was pretty awesome to have a dream that's so young and then be able to, to come up through the ranks. <laughs> and awesome to have your dad support you, obviously, too. Uh, I know lots of kids dream about being a race car driver, but you actually set out to make it happen. How did, how did you get started? I got started... Uh, you know, like when I was 13 and, and, you know, my dad really didn't know anything about racing. I didn't know anything about racing. We just like watching it. So we kind of just went in there as rookies, all of us did. So, so we didn't really have any, you know, good background in, in racing at all. So it was, uh, it was really hard for us at first. And then we just, just kind of got better and better as, as the time went on. We all learned together. Yeah. So, so how you were uh, referencing your uh, race team. So tell us about your race team and how you all came together. So it, our race team was just more of a, a bunch of buddies that really didn't know what we were doing. And then we, we ended up, you know, figuring out more and more and more. We all had different skill sets. So like one guy knew how to work with electronics really good. So he handled our radios. One guy really knew how to read tires. So 
he hit our tires and then, you know, I, I drove and, and my dad just kind of let everything happen. And it, it was just, uh, it was actually pretty awesome how we, we became so good at, at what we were doing. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. And I know to do something like this, you have to have sponsors, right? So who are your sponsor partners and what is your relationship like with them? So my, uh, sp my partners are Buds, Keys Travel, Azalea Realty, Q's Barbecue, and Mass Mutual Greater Richmond. Uh, we really have a great relationship with them. It, uh, we, we all work, work together very, very good, you know, on, on our Facebook, Instagram, everything. Um, they, they promote me, I, I promote them. So we, we all have a really good relationship. We talk to them very, very, like a lot. Yeah, you, you know, so <laughs> getting a chance to do this, like, I know that there's got to be a huge responsibility you driving with sponsors on your car, right? So I'm sure there's a lot of pressure, but what races have you done this season and how did they go? Uh, this season, I ran Richmond, Texas, and Pocono. Uh, Richmond did not go very good for us. We had a lot of issues, radio issues, and then we had a power steering go out for the last 50 laps, so I had to throw a 3,500 pound car into a corner without any power steering. Oh, go wow. 100, go 160. And then Texas was a really good race for us. We, uh, we started 37th and finished 23rd. So, uh, we did really good in that race. And then Pocono, we had radio issues at the beginning at, of that race again. And we started 39th and finished 22nd. Nice. So we, uh, we're really getting really good in, in the truck series. And, you know, we, we've been picking up, uh, about, 17 places each race. So uh, very, very happy with the way the season's going. And I love that you seem like you're working with a lot of local people as well. And that's really exciting because it's also important, not only what you do on the track, but off the track. And I know you've done a lot of work to raise money for the Ask Foundation. What did they do and, and why did you choose to work with them? I chose to, to work with them. Uh, it, it's just such a great organization that, that they have there. And uh, when, when I got presented with it, I was like, you know, that would be awesome to, to really go out there. And one of my sponsors, Q's Barbecue, they, they also help out as foundation. So I was like, hey, well, you know, we can all partner up together and just, you know, help out. And what does the Ask Foundation do? They, uh, they help out uh, childhood cancer. Okay. So um, it, it's, it's such a great thing for, for them to – the organization got started by a very, very young lady too. So mm -hmm. it, it, it's – she actually unfortunately had it. So she just wants to present love to everyone that is going through it right now. Wow. All right. Now <clears throat> I have a question for you only because I've had the pleasure of competing against you and you're very, very confident there, Howie. Uh, mm -hmm. But what, what makes you so good at racing? That's what I need to know. So I can beat you the next time. <laughs> oh man. You have to have a, a lot of testosterone. That's all. <laughs> that's the only thing I can, I can tell you. To enjoy <laughs> adrenaline, I have to imagine. <laughs> oh yeah, you you know it, it's one of those uh, deals where you know after you race, you're up for four more hours because you you know you even if it's a eleven at night after a race, you're, you're up for four more hours because you you'd be going 180 miles per hour and then you uh, go from being to zero miles per hour, so you just stay up and your blood's pumping and everything's great. That those four is hours there, are great. Is there a specific type of car that you enjoy racing the most? Every every car or truck that I've jumped in, uh, I love all of them. Yeah, they 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 all they all drive differently. Uh, the trucks are a lot of fun to drive. So much downforce, you can really drive it in, into the corner really hard. Uh, so I, I really enjoy that a lot. Now I know if I said that I could drive it into the corner really hard, my mother would lose her mind. And be like, "What are you trying to wreck this vehicle for?" <laughs> That's a NASCAR term. I learned it from Howie, Mama. Okay. That's right. <laughs> now, uh, how one of our sister shows on your view uh, is called Driven, and they are putting the third season uh, uh, together. I guess starting in September. Now, uh, your story will be featured on this first show. What will viewers see in this episode? They'll see my whole life story. Uh, basically, everything that you know I've uh, I've gone through. Uh, you know, they'll, they'll see the house. Uh, what, what I like to do for for fun. So it, it's just it's just a whole view of just my whole life and then they, they were there for my first richmond race in nascar so so that was so they captured a very special moment as well so uh I, it was very great to, to have them out and uh just for, for them to tell my story yeah nice so great well how, how can viewers keep up with you and your team if you want to keep up with us you can follow us on facebook at howie d savino racing team uh, Instagram for how we do this, Savino, Twitter for HD Savino, and uh, we have updates all the time. So uh, you, you'll definitely stay updated. Howie, thanks so much for making the time, man. 
Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> no problem, man. Uh, well, before you guys race off anywhere like Mr. Howie there, don't. Don't go anywhere because we have lots of fun things to do in Nevada coming up next. Welcome back to Main Street Living. Another good show today so far, guys. You got that right. Now, uh, of course, after our conversation with NASCAR driver Howie DeSafino, this next segment seems appropriate because now, Danielle, you're doing a little driving, huh? Yes, in more ways than one, actually. Uh, I headed over <laughs> to Top Golf on the Vegas Strip, and I got to drive there in style in a gorgeous Lexus ES350, courtesy of Lexus of Las Vegas. It was so much fun. You have to check this out. What's up, guys? I'm Danielle Avari. Welcome into Experience Nevada, where we get to explore all of the beauty and entertainment that Nevada has to offer. Today, we're headed to Top Golf, one of the premier entertainment destinations in Las Vegas, to hit the tees and see how our swings are looking. But to get there, we're going to take the Lexus ES350. And here to tell us all about that beautiful ride, let's bring in Crystal from Lexus of Las Vegas. Thanks, Danielle. Today, you'll be driving the ES350. You're gonna love the ES350. It is a beautiful mid-size sedan with a nice engine, 3.5 liter V6, so plenty of power for coming in and out of traffic to get wherever you need to go. The ES350 is an eye-catching vehicle. It is beautiful, it has very clean, crisp lines, very sleek, modern design. And you can find this vehicle right here at Lexus of Las Vegas. Thanks, Crystal. Well, we better get on the road before we miss our tea time. So we are on our way to Top Golf, which is very cool because I've never been, and I'm very excited to go because it's right on the strip. It's right in the middle of the action. So we're going to be driving past there and uh, taking this nice little zippy ride around. This is a fun little car to have driving along the Las Vegas Strip. You can see all of the fun hotels: New York, New York, the Stratosphere. I mean. The entire skyline is amazing. I personally haven't swung a club in like four years, so we will see if it's like riding a bike. We'll see if I still have the swing. Top Golf Las Vegas is a premier entertainment location, just steps away from the Las Vegas Strip. Top Golf blends um, technology and entertainment, where socializing is a sport. The energy is always great. Guests will come into the venue and they'll see that the energy is buzzing. They'll be able to do anything that they like, go to the pool, go to the bars, and it's all fun and games for them. That's a nice shot. That's it. Everybody loves to come out and hit golf balls, especially when it's hot in the nice air conditioning. Anyone and everyone can play at Top Golf. There's no level that needs to be hit. Uh, you can come here to hit golf balls as a professional, or you can come here and hit golf balls as a total beginner. I think, I think it went in the street. I think it went in the street. Well, that does it for us from Top Golf. We all found our swing, and you can too. Just check out Top Golf, and there's plenty to do there, whether it's drinks or the pool, or maybe you are going to hit the range. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Experience Nevada. <laughs> you know, I'm laughing because num number one, great package. I mean, you were able to hit the ball, but on that last part where you said it went into the street, and <laughs> Cheryl shows up today with an eye patch. Yeah, <laughs> unrelated. Unrelated. Incident. Totally unrelated. You know, I could blame it on you and make it more fun that way. But no, again, this is just an eye surgery. Yeah. But, <laughs> you know, Danielle, I don't know how well I would do driving a Lexus with, with one eye, but I am jealous that you got to do it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So well, when your eye is all healed up, Cheryl, you and all of our viewers can find more information <laughs> about the incredible vehicles and deals available at Lexus of Las Vegas on their website, LexusofLasVegas.com. All right. Can't wait to drive that Lexus. We're going to switch gears a little bit coming up next on Main Street Living. We're going to show some support for military families. Stick around.
Hey guys, welcome back to Main Street Living. Ladies, we are having one of these great shows. We're moving. <laughs> moving and grooving. But we couldn't move on yet from our conversation with NASCAR driver Howie D. Sabino without talking about a road trip, right, Cheryl? Yes, you know how I love a good road trip, and there is no better way to explore the silver state of Nevada than with a drive along the Free Range Art Highway. Take a look at this. Ready to hit the road? If awesome art, wide open roads, and weird Nevada wonderment get your gears turning, then for the love of odd, Nevada's Free Range Art Highway is the blank canvas for your next adventure. One far out trip from Las Vegas to Reno. A little more than one and a half hours northwest of Las Vegas, you'll find the historic mining town of Beatty and the first stop on your road trip. Happy Burrow Chili and Beer. This storied sagebrush saloon is a great place to beat the heat, get a lay of the land and surrounding Death Valley National Park, and swap stories with locals and road trippers, all while getting a taste of award-winning homemade chili and ice-cold beer. Ready for a ghost story? Or two? Slip outside Beatty for a quick 10-minute ride to the most photographed ghost town in Nevada. Part of Beatty's gold mining discoveries, Rio Lake Ghost Town was one of Southern Nevada's celebrated boomtowns. The ruins are found around every corner, like the school, bank, jail, and more. Be sure to check out the Tom Kelly Bottle House, the oldest, largest, and most complete house made entirely of glass bottles in the country, along with Goldwell Open Air Museum's wild sculptures. Cruise an hour on up to Goldfield for the night, then bed down at the Santa Fe Motel and Saloon that puts you in the heart of this living ghost town's historic district. In the morning, head to the International Car Forest on the southern edge of town to discover a junkyard of painted, planted vehicles. With freedom of expression and art in weird places, the Car Forest is a great place to get to know Nevada's weirdest, wildest west. In a place made famous by actual fields of gold-rich ore, Learn about some of the most famous gold mines in Nevada and the West at Goldfield's Florence Mine Tour. The mine claim brought in $650,000 in gold, an amount that would be more than $44 million today. The historic Florence Mine has the only remaining hoist house in the once massive Goldfield Mining District, which just so happens to be one of the best preserved mining relics in all of the Silver State. Kick back for the night in historic opulence at the Lux Mitzpah Hotel, a place still swanky after more than 110 years. The Mitzpah has been part of the Tonopah story since the beginning, with era-authentic chandeliers, antique cash registers, velour Victorian couches, and resident ghosts to prove it. Stay on the fifth floor, a favorite haunt of the Lady in Red Ghost. As your last stop on this Las Vegas to Tonopah portion of the Free Range Art Highway, dig your own Nevada treasure at Odyssey Brothers Turquoise Mine Tour. Sling your pickaxe into massive tailing piles with gems spanning the color spectrum, including robin's egg blue, cerulean, indigo, and teals. Best yet, you've only road tripped half the Free Range Art Highway. Head up the road to Reno or make the return trip to Vegas. No matter where the road carries you, follow your curiosities on and off Nevada's eccentric slice of US 95. Oh, Quincy Danielle, that looks like so much fun. You know I love a good road trip and I really wanna go digging for turquoise. How fun yeah. would that be? That does not surprise me, Cheryl. I just, I feel a little bit personally attacked because I feel like I just left Nevada, you know, like we just broke up and now Nevada's posting all these hot pictures on oh. my timeline and now I'm just, I'm jealous, but I guess we can all plan a trip together and you can find more ways to enjoy and explore Nevada at travelnevada.com. <laughs> yeah, I think a road trip is in order. What do you say? Danielle, Q, are we going to go together? I think I'm ready. I'm ready to be heard again. Yeah. As long as we don't find your car buried sticking halfway out the ground. No, <laughs> yeah, no my sure car is going to stay at home. I'm going to fly out there and I'm going to run a car. <laughs> but guys, don't go anywhere. We've got a lot coming up. We're going to show support for military families. Hey, welcome back to Main Street Living. Now, ladies, with all of the focus on the situation in Afghanistan over the past couple of weeks, uh, we've been seeing and hearing about the needs of many of our veterans as well. 
I know. And Operation Homefront's mission is to help military families thrive no matter what their situation or their needs. Take a look at this. Operation Homefront was started post 9-11 in 2002 by military spouses and it's now turned into a national nonprofit. We serve active duty, reserve, National Guard and veteran families in the communities that they work so hard to protect. Our mission is to build strong, stable and secure military families. This program benefits uh, active duty reserve National Guard military families in the local area. Uh, we serve all 50 states and four territories, so anywhere that they're stationed or uh, decided to retire, we serve the families in those communities. Today we are stuffing 350 backpacks for local military families. We're serving those in the area of Phoenix, Tucson, and Las Vegas. An event like this is so important to us because during the summer is when a lot of our active duty military families are transitioning into new installations, so getting comfortable with their new community. And as we all know, the struggles we face moving and the, the chaos and all that. So this is a way for us to welcome them into the community and welcome their students and their kiddos uh, into the new communities that they're gonna serve in. So we're providing all the back to school needs that they re are required for a successful year. This year we're going to serve our 450th thousandth backpack. Since inception of the program, this saves our military families $50 million. So each family will receive a backpack for their child along with the school supplies needed uh, that are age appropriate. So we have things for our kindergartners such as crayons and glue sticks um, and then our high school kids, you know, calculators, protractors, uh, dividers, things like that. Military families need all the help they can get. They struggle financially and they just need all the help that they can get and so as veterans and veterans auxiliary organization it's up to us to give them all the support that we can. We went to 15 Dollar Tree stores to collect all the supplies over the last month so I want to thank Dollar Tree as well for all of their donations. I would like to thank Operation Homefront, Cox Communications, all of our post members and uh, auxiliary members who showed up today and CVMA, the Combat Veterans Motorcycle Association. From Cox Communications, there are about 20 of us here today. Some of the things that we did today were uh, gather the uh, book bags and we went ahead and put all the pens and pencils, all the school supplies in them. It's very important for military families to have this, especially those who uh, are, you know, have a challenge uh, purchasing these kind of items. I mean, it's a wonderful thing to give to them. We'd like to thank Operation Homefront and the VFW for having us here today. Uh, the military family supported us through our careers and we would like the opportunity to say thank you and give back to them as well. For more information, they'll visit uh, operationhomefront.org if they would like to volunteer, uh, donate, or sign up for the event themselves. <laughs> wow, wow. Now the one thing that I can always say about Cox um, Communications is that they are never like this, you know, every man for themselves. Like they're always behind great community mm. efforts. Wonderful. Yeah, I love the causes yeah. they get behind. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And this cause is incredible. And you can learn more about Operation Homefront's mission and how you can get or give help at operationhomefront.org. Straight ahead, we have more Main Street Living right here. Welcome back into Main Street Living. Quincy, I don't know about you, but I think I'm going to miss Pirate Cheryl next week. <laughs> Is she coming back? <laughs> oh, you guys, I'm not. I'm not. I can't wait to get this thing off and hopefully the eye surgery and everything is healing the way it should. And I hope to be back to normal next week. And I know a lot of people want to get back to normal. There's so many natural disasters impacting so many around the country right now, the wildfires yes. out west. And then we mentioned Hurricane Ida affecting uh, Louisiana, Mississippi, and then all the points to the north and east and our hearts go out to them and just just stay out of that area right now. I know they have a lot of recovery to do. Right, and if you're able to donate to help our neighbors in New Orleans, go to nola.eater.com for a list of organizations on the ground. That's N-O-L-A dot E-A-T-E-R dot com. 
And of course, guys, don't forget, you can catch this episode and so many of our other episodes on our Cox Contour app as well. So stay tuned. And new episodes of Main Street Living Mondays, 9 p.m. local times. Make sure you join us then as we take another stroll down Main Street.